The staggering rise in energy prices and the stark warning on how it will cost lives. An 80% increase to the price cap will come into force in October, taking the average household bill to £3,549. More money needs to be given to people on benefits, people on pensions and lower and middle income workers. Then we are see physical and health risks that are manifest and people will die this winter. Boris Johnson says more help is coming, but it'll be up to his successor. Anushka will be here to explain the options being considered and how long we'll have to wait. Also on News at 10 tonight. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. Our country's a wreck. Donald Trump reacts in anger as the U.S. Department of Justice releases papers explaining why they ordered a raid on his Florida home. The second man is arrested by police in Liverpool investigating the murder of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell. Vaccine wars why Moderna is taking Pfizer and BioNTech to court and... It was once curtains for this Picasso classic now given a new lease of life in Paris. This is ITV News at 10 with Lucrezia Millerini. Good evening. As Energy Bill's campaigner Martin Lewis of Money Saving Expert fame put it, it wasn't a surprise, but it was a shock. With half an eye on keeping the remaining energy supplies in business, the regulator Ofgen confirmed that come October, the energy price cap will top £3,500 a year, nearly three times what it was last winter. And that is just for direct debit. For prepayment customers, it'll be higher still. Bills in Northern Ireland are worked out differently, but could end up £1,000 lower. Well, both the outgoing Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, and the new Chancellor, Nadine Zahawi, have said more help is coming without saying what or when. The analysts who accurately predicted today's figure say by April the average bill will be £6,600. Typical annual bills already high are on course to rise dramatically, reaching more than £3,500 and today leaving customers stunned. It's the most daunting um, revelation. It's a big struggle, you know, and I'm finding it very hard as well as well a lot of other people out there. So I do worry, you know, going into winter how it's going to be. I'm pretty terrified if I'm honest. This mum left her job to care for a disabled son and says she's already living on the breadline. I just don't know how they can justify the energy prices and put people in this position. I am worried about the um, heating. I can't expect them to layer up, whereas I might put on extra layers. I can't say to a three-year-old, you need to wear this in the house because I can't afford to pay the heating. The 80% price cap rise affects 24 million homes on standard tariffs. It means a typical energy user will pay almost £300 a month. The cap for those on prepayment meters is even higher, at more than £3,600 annually. Prices are expected to rise again in January, with experts predicting more than £5,000. I know for many families this is going to be devastating. This is the head of Ofgem. He's the government energy official tasked with setting fair prices. What do you say to customers who are angry today and blame you? They say Ofgem should be protecting customers and the price cap at the moment is not. This is not a problem that Ofgem or the industry or the charities involved can solve on our own. We need the help of government. We need that new ministerial team to take urgent and decisive action. You to press that one, eh? that yeah, yeah. Right. The head of the current ministerial team was touring a hospital today where he had to address this financial emergency. There's a pipeline of cash coming through over the next few months and uh, through the, uh, the autumn and the, the winter. But that is clearly now going to be augmented, increased by extra cash that the government is plainly going to be announcing in September. 
This food bank was restocking today. Charities are bracing for a surge in demand, with predictions 4.5 million more households could be in fuel poverty. Campaigners say current government help on energy is dangerously inadequate. Just more money needs to be given to people on benefits, people on pensions and lower and middle income workers. Then we are see physical and health risks that are manifest and people will die this winter. Customers now know that just as temperatures fall, costs will rocket. Government today sympathetically acknowledged the anxiety. But warm words won't pay the bills. Chris Troy, News at 10. One of the households up and down Britain, some desperate calculations are being made to work out how on earth those bills can be paid. Anushka is here to take us through how it's come to this and what help there is that we already know about. Anushka. Thank you. So, look, the price cap was introduced in 2019 to protect consumers on the most expensive tariffs. But it doesn't feel very protective right now. This chart shows that rise in the typical annual bill that you've been talking about, heading up above three, five, and then £6,000. But, look, the price cap is not actually a limit on your total bill. It is the maximum providers can charge customers per unit of energy they use. On October the 1st, that is rising from 28 to 52 pence per kilowatt hour for electricity and 7 to 15 pence for gas. You've seen what that does to annual figures, but let's just focus in on autumn and winter because we use more energy when it's cold. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says that from the 1st of October to 31st of December last year, a typical household would have run up £377 on their bills. And we've had to make that small to make room for what's coming. It would be £590 for the same three-month period this year with the current cap. But now that household is facing over £1,000, nearly three times what it was last year. What's driving this? Well, Ofgem point to wholesale prices spiking after the pandemic and soaring after Russia invaded Ukraine. Now, the government has put in place a support package worth over £30 billion. That's £400 off bills for everyone. If you're on means-tested benefits, another £650 in two payments, one already made, £300 for pensioners and £150 for those on disability payments. But nearly everyone agrees more is needed. Labour, the Lib Dems, the SNP and actually some energy companies say it's time to freeze the cap, with the government making up the shortfall. The Resolution Foundation has suggested a solidarity 1% income tax rise to cut bills. But the government is waiting for Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss, neither of whom have given us masses of detail on what they'll do. We do know that Rishi Sunak would scrap VAT on energy bills for a year, saving £154 on a typical bill. He's also promising an even bigger support package focused on the most vulnerable, but he hasn't yet put a number on it. Liz Truss would pause green levies worth £153 a year and reverse a rise in national insurance. But look, millions of people earn too little to gain from that tax cut. She has said she's not keen on handouts, but she has now made clear today there will be urgent additional action. If she wins, we just don't know what yet. Anushka, thank you. A lot of factors at play there. And as Anushka just explained, the 3,500 figure is an average. For some households, it could be less than that. And for others coping with special circumstances, it could be an awful lot more. The new price cap is a life-changing amount of money and not in a good way, as we've been finding out in Bristol. There's no escaping the impact of this. Communities will be hit. And as we found touring the city, Bristol is no exception. Grant Parfit is feeling it. His brain injury from a car crash left him reliant on benefits. I leave it on the home screen and it stays there at the back. To meet his bills, he's now having to use the compensation he got from the accident. It was supposed to last a lifetime. It won't. I think, how am I going to cope? How am I going to manage? How am I going to feed my daughter? How am I going to feed myself? How am I going to clothe my daughter? And when you think of all those things, do you find any answers? No answer. It just makes me very upset and kind of useless, worthless. Um, and what temperature are we, are we at in here? We're at two at the moment. In another part of the city, Tom Murray has shut his butcher's business. After 30 years, electric costs were the final straw. You can't run a business for no profit. And it's a high cost on electric. 
extremely high cost anyway. So ours went from six and a half, seven to 22,000. And that's the first jump. At a small free family event, we found school worker Jade and her son Logan. Like many parents, she wonders how she'll fund her way through the winter. Well, electric's normally the most priority because if you ain't got electric, you can't run a lot. Well, can't run nothing. Cooker, microwave, anything in the house really, lights. And obviously having a small child as well, you, you need all that to be able to put a roof over their head, to be able to do anything. The realities here are bleak. It's the choice between energy and eating. And it's still warm, it's still summertime. So imagine what it'll be like two, three months from now when it's cold. Tarek tells me he works three jobs just to cover his home costs. Shopkeeping isn't enough on its own. I've already just today signed a kind of petition for small businesses to have a little cap, you know, give us a bit of a leeway for small businesses to you know, reduce our electricity, electricity bill so we can survive. Energy costs will hit some more than others, but it's clear that the financial pain is already hurting and the worst is yet to come. Rupert Evelyn, News at 10, Bristol. Well, Chris is here and Anushka is back. Chris, let's start with you. Pain is on the way, that is clear, but for some, they'll start feeling it within days. They will, because although the prices go up in October, energy companies can start changing direct debits from the start of next month, the start of September, so a lot of people will get some fairly horrific notifications. And just to underscore that, I've got the very latest price predictions from one of the most respected energy forecasters, Cornwall Insight. Now, they're saying in January, expect that figure to be £5,300. Mm -hmm. But then in April, they're talking about 6,600. I mean, I can hardly believe we're speaking about such huge figures. After that, they say things will fall back a little bit simply because recession will perhaps curtail the requirement for energy. And it's not just the prices that are bad, it's also the timing that is, is catastrophic mm. in that 80% of domestic gas use happens between October and March. Now, this year, it's going to cost three times the amount as last winter. So you can imagine the pain that is going to inflict on families throughout the day. We've heard all of these reassurances that something will be done, but so far, just words, no actions, no new policies. Well, Anushka, th that, that's the question to you, isn't it? Because the pain is going to start before we even know what the plan is. Yeah, I mean, the crisis is upon us and we've got a caretaker government mm. who effectively cannot do anything. We know that Treasury officials are drawing up options right now. Nadim Zahawi, the current Chancellor, has told them to put everything on the table. There'll be ideas like, for example, you know, more payments for those on universal credit. But he's actually stressed in an article tonight that people above that are going to really, really struggle too. He's talked about senior teachers on £45,000 really feeling the squeeze. Now, Rishi Sunak is going to hint at his plans a bit more strongly in an op-ed tonight, as I understand it. Liz Truss is the clear front-runner, so we're very interested in what she's going to say. And she has talked about not really liking handouts, preferring tax cuts that help the slightly better off. Reality check has arrived today, hasn't it, for everybody? And it's very clear now that there are going to be handouts and that she will have to put that support forward if she wins. But, you know, I saw her in Norwich yesterday and she still wants to stress this point. She doesn't like taking tax off people only to give money back. And she doesn't think we can just have a six months sticking plaster. That were her, those were her words. She thinks we need to do something in the long term. Think about energy supply. But some of her critics worry that her plans will be inflationary and they say we need urgent action right now. It's a very worrying time for many people. Anushka and Chris, thank you. Well, for more details about the impact of the October price cap plus energy saving tips, there is a special section on our website at itv.com slash cost of living. Next, to that raid on Donald Trump's home in Florida nearly three weeks ago. Now we know what the FBI was after. Its legal grounds for a search warrant were released by a judge today, although large parts were blacked out. It showed, however, that boxes of papers returned to the National Archive by Mr Trump in January contained a large number of documents labelled confidential, secret and top secret that should never have left the White House. 
Not a great look as Mr Trump weighs up whether to run for president for a second time. Well, Mr Trump said the judge had hated him anyway. It was the FBI raid on a former president's home that unleashed a political firestorm. The unprecedented move raised a startling question of what national secrets Donald Trump had taken from the White House and why. It has long been known that Trump's chaotic exit from the presidency also saw boxes of documents being flown out. And it ignited a fierce debate with the National Archives about who had the right to hold on to such sensitive paperwork. What lies at the heart of the concern is that Mar-a-Lago is a popular resort, not just a private home. And that secrets kept here are highly vulnerable to espionage. The affidavit released today, essentially the justification for the FBI raid, is heavily redacted. This is the list of paragraphs that have been blacked out. Uh, you know, when I was in law school, there were actually words on the page that you could read. Uh, but TV networks and legal analysts poured over the documents looking for clues. With you, we can't stress enough how unprecedented this is, releasing parts of an affidavit at this point in an investigation. President Biden is trying to distance himself from the investigation for fear it looks like he's trying to destroy a former president and possibly a future one too. But he couldn't avoid heavily mocking one of Trump's main defenses. Well, I just want to know I've declassified everything in the world. I'm president. I can do it all. Come on. Declassified everything. I'm not going to comment on it because I don't know the detail. I don't even want to know. I'll let the Justice Department take care of it. Trump himself is responding today with an all-out assault on his critics. On a podcast today claiming politics, not national security, is at play. I did nothing wrong, and it's the exact same thing here. We were essentially attacked. We were broken into. They opened up safes. They brought safe crackers in. They brought many, many FBI agents in, all right before the midterms. The people understand it. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. Our country's a wreck. So first of all, say I, I, Family members have joined the counterattack, hinting at dark forces. And so I think what the judge do is release all the information. I think that's in the public's interest. This way people can know whether there's a serious allegation or this is more manufactured. But just ahead of the raid, the FBI wrote to a federal judge, based upon the following facts, there is probable cause to believe that the locations to be searched at the premises contain evidence, contraband, fruits of crime or other items illegally possessed. Donald Trump left the White House over 18 months ago, and yet his behavior and decisions during those final fateful days still dominate the political landscape. And Robert, you're there at Mar-a-Lago. What damage, in your view, is this done to former President Trump? Well, I mean, on one level, it looks disastrous. Look, the former president's uh, negligence with nationally uh, sensitive information is well known. In this case, it may have been criminal. He may have violated the 1917 Espionage Act. And the question of whether uh, he will be charged with a crime is perhaps the biggest single question arching over. American politics. But it's interesting to note the Republicans today have been pretty quiet. It feels like they're watching the political weather. And it may be that uh, the former president's critics have overreacted and overreached yet again. I mean, they had suggested he had compromised uh, nuclear secrets here, a uh, weapons program uh, secrets as well. And yet it's not clear that is what the FBI has yet found. And in one real sense, it plays to Donald Trump's strengths. He can steer once more the outrage machine against the establishment and against the FBI. And he can enter his favorite political space, being at the heart of a national maelstrom. All right, Robert, in Florida, thank you. We well, hear Merseyside police promised yesterday they would find the gunman who shot dead Olivia Pratt Corbell. Tonight, they have two men under arrest. Both are suspected of murdering Olivia and attempting to murder her mother and the man who was chased into their house. One was arrested last night, the other this afternoon. In the middle of the night in Merseyside came the breakthrough police had been hoping for. This video shows armed officers leading a 36-year-old man into the back of a van. He'd just been arrested on suspicion of shooting dead a nine-year-old girl. 
Today, police collected evidence from the flat in Highton. After a three-day manhunt, the suspect had been found just two miles away from the home of Olivia Pratt Corbell. That's where she was the night she was murdered, standing in her hallway when two strangers burst in. One was firing bullets at the other, and nine-year-old Olivia was hit in the chest. Four days on, this street is still a crime scene. And today, the Home Secretary came as far as the cordon with a promise of extra funding, both for the police and the people who live here. All our thoughts with Olivia and Olivia's family at this really devastating and sad time. Uh, there's a lot of activity that's taking place. There's a lot of policing activity. There's also a lot of support, and that'll be £150,000 just as a start for the local community. And it's important that we put that support package in. It's a care package, effectively, for local residents. The people of Liverpool have found lots of ways to show they care from two famous footballers, Ian Rush and Ian Snowden, who came today to lay wreaths from their former clubs, to another who paid tribute to Olivia at a pre-match press conference. I'm personally devastated. I've got a ten-year-old daughter myself, so I can't imagine what the family go through right now. And um, I hope that that family gets justice as soon as possible. Police are tonight still questioning that 36-year-old man and in the past hour they've confirmed they've also arrested a 33-year-old man from the Dovecot area. Both men are being questioned on suspicion of murder and two counts of attempted murder. People here are only just beginning to process their shock. But tonight there is hope here that there might be some justice for an innocent nine-year-old girl. Chloe Keady, News at 10, Dovecot in Liverpool. The Royal Mail Workers Union, the CWU, is calling today's 24-hour strike the biggest in the UK since 2009. The union says 115,000 of its members didn't go to work today in protest at having a pay rise of 2% forced on them. And they'll be doing the same next Wednesday and on September the 8th and 9th. So no post or parcels on those days either. Liz Truss's comments about France's President Macron might have won her a few cheers and, who knows, even a few votes at last night's leadership hustings. But the man himself, funnily enough, wasn't best pleased. She said her, she hadn't decided whether he was a friend or a foe. He said that that was a problem. Boris Johnson chipped in with some schoolboy French. Emmanuel Macron is a très bon buddy, he said. When Liz Truss took to the stage last night, she knew she was among friends. Hi. And perhaps being aware that not everyone in the Tory party is a committed Francophile, this is how the Foreign Secretary answered a question about the French President. Um, President Macron, friend or foe? The, the jury's out. But if I... If I... If, if, I, if, I become, if I become Prime Minister, I'll judge him on deeds, not words. Today, President Macron said there were serious problems if the two nations didn't know whether they were friends or enemies before giving his assessment. The British people, he said, the nation of the UK is a good friend and an ally, whoever its leaders are and sometimes in spite of its leaders and the little mistakes they might make in comments on the campaign trail. Here, the Prime Minister, who was once reportedly called a clown by the French president, made light of the controversy. Emmanuel Macron is a très bon, très bon buddy de, 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 de notre pays. So, so Liz Truss, your Foreign Secretary was wrong to say the jury's out. I think, I think that... Uh, the, the relations between the UK and France are of uh, huge importance. They've been very good for uh, a long time. Although some former colleagues are a bit less relaxed about it. Do you think this will actually do any damage? Does it really matter? It's a slip of the mind that shouldn't happen. Uh, foreign secretaries remain foreign secretaries, even though they're candidates, and particularly if they're going to be prime minister. And it's the sort of slip that somebody somewhere in France will remember. And there are serious issues at play, most notably the cross-channel migrant crisis, whether or not the French are doing enough to stop it, and whether or not the UK is paying its fair share of the costs of patrols. Carl Dinan, News at 10, Westminster. 
Some of the worst floods for years in Pakistan have destroyed buildings and lives. Thousands of people have been marooned across the country. The Prime Minister, Shabazz Sharif, says this flooding is worse than in 2010 when 1,700 people were killed. He said it had been caused by the horrors of climate change, but together Pakistanis would be able to build back better. At the start of the pandemic, the race to find a vaccine was all-consuming for the pharmaceutical companies. Millions of lives and billions of pounds are at stake. Now one of those companies, Moderna, has taken another Pfizer and its German partner, BioNTech, to court. Moderna claims the other two copied their technology. Well, Ian Woods is here. Um, so explain what it's all about. Well, in the race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, Moderna thought they had a head start on their competitors because long before the pandemic, they had developed mRNA technology, which teaches human cells how to make a protein that triggers an immune response. Now, Moderna is saying that Pfizer and its partner BioNTech copied their inventions. And what might irritate them just as much is that Pfizer's vaccine narrowly beat Moderna in the race for approval in both Britain and America. Now, in the midst of the pandemic, there was a certain amount of altruism around. And Moderna said they wouldn't legally challenge other companies as they develop vaccines, particularly for poorer countries. But it's back to business as usual now, and this is a very expensive business. Moderna is saying we invested billions of dollars in this. Of course, they've earned billions of dollars as well, as have Pfizer. And they haven't put a figure on how much they're trying to claim back yet. Moderna has filed its claims in Massachusetts and also in Germany, where BioNTech is based. Now, Pfizer say they'll defend uh, their patents. A spokesman said they're surprised by the litigation, but perhaps they shouldn't be surprised because claims for patent infringement are actually quite common mm -hmm. in the pharmaceuticals industry. And, of course, the science is constantly evolving. And the Moderna vaccine... Uh, the latest one uh, got approval last week and it's going to be in our arms later this winter as a booster. Yep, sure is. Ian, thank you. The traditional trip uh, to see the Queen before moving into Downing Street might be a rather longer one for Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak in 10 days' time. They may have to fly up to Balmoral instead if the Queen's mobility problems stop her flying back to London or Windsor especially. The Queen is due to appoint her new Prime Minister on Tuesday, the 6th of September, the day after the results of the Conservative leadership contest. She had planned to break into her 10-week holiday in Scotland to fly south, a decision on where the meeting will take place is due to be confirmed next week. And finally, a night at the opera usually begins with a curtain going up, but in the new production on the outskirts of Paris, the curtain won't be going up or down. It is the star of the show. Why? Well, it was created by Picasso more than a century ago, and it's just been restored, and it's now the backdrop for a performance of the music for which it was originally made. It is the curtain call France has waited a century to see. The work of the greatest name in 20th century art on surely his biggest canvas that rose and fell over a short-lived ballet during the First World War. Picasso, who throughout his long career has alternately astonished, shocked and delighted us with his work, is evidently... And while Picasso, ever prolific, went on to break new artistic ground, his curtain faded and was largely forgotten. Not a masterpiece, but a miracle of survival. One of the owners of the curtain uh, used to, to show it in its uh, storage room for, full of vehicles and usually opened uh, to renew air once a year or two. So the curtain was in, uh, has uh, suffered uh, different, difficult uh, conditions of preservation. <laughs> It was perhaps the best thing about the performances it opened and closed. An avant-garde ballet, conceived to spread a little joie de vivre in wartime Paris, to distract from the horrors of the Western Front. A collaboration of three cultural icons, music by Eric Satie and story by Jean Cocteau. Picasso did the costumes too. The cardboard proved difficult to dance in. Audiences booed. When the ballet folded, the curtain was packed away. Until now. We are very proud, very honoured to host the restoration of the stage curtain. So people uh, coming together here in the inner room with uh, such a, an important work, yes. Now restored and returned to its rightful place in the theatre, where the ballet's music will be played once again. No dancing this time. It's Picasso's curtain that will take centre stage. John Ray, News at 10.
and it's time for the curtain to calm down on news at 10 for tonight. Good night. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.